Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Public Works Podcast. My name is Joseph Blackman, and today I got a real treat for you. Her name is Janice Allen Jackson, and she is the owner of Janice, uh, yeah, principal of Janice Allen Jackson and Associates, and she is also the host of the Local Matters Podcast of Georgia. So if you're on YouTube, go to go over to Local Matters Podcast of Georgia, hit the subscribe button. Janice, say what's up to everybody. Hello, so happy to join you this morning. Hope you're well. I know you said you're a little stuffed, so you may fast or something today. I don't know if I'm going that far, but, <laughs> but, but I'm feeling good after the Thanksgiving holiday. Sure. So yeah, to all the listeners out there, if you're listening to this in 2050, this is the day after Thanksgiving in 2023. And Janice and I decided to get a podcast show done just so we can connect and talk more about who she is, what she's into. So Janice, kind of give us, so you're the principal of Janice Allen Jackson and Associates. Talk us through what problem you solve or what you do with Janice Allen Jackson and Associates. Yeah, I'll start off, uh, if you'll allow, by just giving a little history on my background. I am a former city and county manager. I call myself a recovering city manager <laughs> because I did that for most of my career. Uh, that's where um, I chose to go after I graduated from graduate school and have been in and around local government organizations since that time. So. Um, as you all may know, many of you listening know local government environments have gotten a little tough. Um, so I decided, hey, maybe I can put those skills to use by forming my own firm. So that was how I got started. I actually started the firm a few years ago and um, now engaging in practice full time. It was sort of like a little part time side gig sort of thing. And now uh, do it full time. Um, I, uh, because of my background, um, human resources, I've uh, uh, settled in on is the most important thing about managing an organization. I mean, you got two things: you got people and money. <laughs> when you're at the at, at an organization and you're trying to make it work, and um, I do a little bit on both of those things, um, but a lot related to people. Uh, I provide executive search services through uh, my work as a senior consultant with developmental associates. They're actually a a uh, firm based in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and they've been doing executive search for a long, long time. So I am one of their uh, senior consultants. Um, I help with uh, recruiting, uh, doing a job analysis, as well as uh, interviewing candidates for jobs. And that's work that I really enjoy. Uh, so executive search is one aspect. And if you know you need an executive search firm hey please get in touch with me i'll get you in touch with the folks at developmental associates and we'll get some things done um, i also do some organizational development work and training um, and i also do what i call strategic services you know sometimes there are things that you know the manager wants to get done but given all the demands they just don't have the bandwidth to take all that on so uh, because i've spent so much time in local government environments i can help you get projects through the finish line so uh, in a nutshell that's what we do we probably can pull off a couple other things too just based upon my background but those are the primary things that we get involved in. Uh, so in terms of solving your problems related to finding people, developing people, building people in your organization, that's when you think about my firm. Interesting, because I, you know, having worked with Public Works in the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years, you do realize that a lot of guys are busy. They're super busy. Mm -hmm. You know, they got so many, they're pulled in so many directions, so many demands, everything's important, everything's urgent. And I could tell they need like an assistant or not even an assistant, just somebody to come in and say, hey, we want to get this project done or we're having this issue but in order to get this issue figured out we need to stop focusing on all, all the important urgent yeah. stuff and get this one thing done right. I, I can tell that that's the it sounds like that's the niche you slide into yeah. within the respective departments that, that that is exactly right um i think that you know Number one, your budgets are lean in many cases, even though people don't realize it as much. They think, oh, government, you just hire people whenever you want to. It doesn't quite work that way. Um, and because the demands have been increasing, I think, particularly after the pandemic, 
you know, a lot of organizations have not gotten back up to full staffing. Um, there are just a lot of things that are pulling on them. And, and frankly, elected officials and the public expecting more for the tax dollar. So there are a lot of reasons that uh, organizations just can't get some things done that they like to get done. So when you are in that situation, I'm the person you call. So pre-COVID, post-COVID, what are some of the changes you've seen? What are some of the differences? You also said you used to work for a city. So like what, mm -hmm. what have you seen in your, I guess, career that has changed to where you're like, oh, okay, this is where the puck is going to be at. So I need to skate over here. Yeah, there so much has changed. And you realize I started back in the dark ages, but <laughs> but so much has changed. Um, a couple of things I'll just point to. We'll start with staffing. As I talk to organizations, um, I'll find out that uh, some of them have vacancy rates that are over 20 percent. In some departments, I was working with one organization, they had over a 40 percent vacancy rate in one department. Um, so even though on the books they had, you know, whatever it was, 3,000 employees, 2,500, 2,600 employees, they had uh, significantly fewer than that employees who were actually on the job at the time. So that created a need for them to do some real prioritization which was kind of hard for elected officials to swallow because like if they think something is important, it's important to it. It's top priority for them, while it may not be top priority for the other elected officials in that organization. So navigating those circumstances can be really, really tough. Um, so lack of people, the other change, I mean, it used, used to be, you know, anybody would come into a local government organization because they were thinking, hey, I work here for 25 or 30 years or whatever it is in that organization. I'll have a nice little benefit package. And now people aren't so concerned about the benefit package. You know, folks folks used to stay, you know, you recruit some 25 year old, he or she's not yeah. necessarily thinking about collecting that pension when they're 55 or 60, you know, they're not thinking about that. So um, that trend toward mobility um, has really shifted the local government environment. Um, other thing, I think residents are more demanding. I alluded to that earlier in the conversation. It used to be that if they knew what was happening, if you had a method for effective one-way communication with them, they were satisfied with that. But now they're expecting two-way communication. You know, you give them information, they want to ask questions. They want to have an efficient means to ask questions. They submit a lot more open records requests than they used to. Um, some of this has to do, I think, with general distrust of government. And we know that, you know, has ramifications at all levels of government. But just that that level of trust, the desire for additional communication, the social media platforms, you know, all that has really changed the way we go about uh, the business of local government these days. Yeah. And and is this generational? Because I'm sure you, you've dealt with all different generations, baby boomers, silent generation, mm -hmm. Gen mm -hmm. X, millennials, Gen Z. So what are you seeing nowadays, like with the whole mental health? I wouldn't say epidemic but like it's it's a buzzword now mm -hmm. you know people want to be they they want to they want to they feel what they feel and you know they want to be able to get across like you said that two-way communication they want to be able to talk about how they're feeling and, and mm -hmm. kind of emote in a way that wasn't it wasn't prevalent back in you know let's say the the 90s and the early, mm -hmm. early 2000s mm -hmm. so what have you seen generational that in, in regards to staffing that has made i guess or four cities to change the way they operate yeah, in terms of staffing, yeah, it's a totally different ball game. You know, I hear people offering some organizations will offer more and more perks, which is a good thing. I mean, which is a good thing because, you know, you think about some of the tech companies like the Googles and so forth. They started offering these really innovative uh, work arrangements, you know, more flexible work arrangements and things like that. You know, it's 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 good. And it's but it's also almost hilarious to me that you know some of the things that folk, folks expect in the workplace now i mean we never would have thought of i mean back when i started you had a job and you were there from eight to five or whatever those hours were and you would never think about asking for any changes like any changes yeah, with your yeah. work schedule i mean it just wasn't a thought 
Yeah, um, now they have unlimited PTO. They got all this paternity, yeah, yeah. maternity leave. PTO, matern you know, paternity leave is something that organizations are grappling with, particularly city governments. It becomes an issue because it's something you never had to deal with. And now, of course, you have, and, and those organizations are predominantly male for the most part. When you look at jobs like public works, police, fire, you know, there's increasing diversity with some of those, particularly police. But when you look at um, the fact that those are male dominated organizations and now uh, they get paternity leave, well, that flips everything up, <laughs> upside down. So, yeah, yeah some yeah. of it is generational. And I can relate it back to uh, some friends who are college professors. You talk to college professors and they'll tell you about how students, students want to argue about the syllabus. And you might have been one of those, you know, they, they want to negotiate the syllabus, you know, with. Uh, the professor. He said, like, what? Negotiate the syllabus? <laughs> we always took it as a given. But I think it's that same thing now. The same folks who wanted to negotiate the syllabus are now asking for things that we would have considered unconventional in the workplace. But we're having to do it because the employee is now pretty much in charge because of the high yeah. vacancy rates right. within organizations. We have had to shift that mindset to say, hey, the employee is in charge. And if pet insurance is important to them, we probably need to look at offering pet insurance as a benefit. So yeah. the pet insurance, the paternity leave, more flexible work schedules, you know, the 36 hour work week and, you know, all those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of those dynamics have really changed over the last sure. you know, 10, 15 years, but particularly after the pandemic. Do, where do you think it's going? I always like to kind of put on that, you know, that futuristic hat and, and have the conversation. 50 years from now, what is it going to look like? You know, I, I'm a believer. I think a lot of uh, jobs will be Uberized, meaning you mm -hmm. can take it. You can find somebody to, to complete a task for you and pay them the money that I guess in, in, comparable to the value that they provided doing that task. And then they can move on and do whatever they want. And you can, you don't have to have full-time employees. You can have people come in. Like if, let's say there needs to be a street of a, a sewer that's flush or there needs to be a, um, a report that needs to be derived or something internally. You can hire somebody to come in, do it. They do the task, you pay them and they go away. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. you know, it's six months later, you could do it again, or you have somebody else do it. I, I don't know if the full-time employee will be around 50, 100 years from now in, in certain aspects of, of work. You know, um, that you, as you bring that up, I think about the, um, um, contracting out the model to contract out, you know, used to not contract anything. I mean, maybe the only thing that you might contract was garbage collection, maybe because it's so routine, you know, it's just like, you know, it's a very well-defined set of tasks and you, you, you know, which makes it easier for you to put out, put out a bid to do. And you, you, you know, just have somebody else pick up your garbage. But now folks are contracting out a whole bunch of things. You go into IT, for instance, uh, even on the human resources side, um, there is the need uh, to, you know, hire an executive search firm, which is part of what we do. That's why that's a growing business is because, yes, you um, they're just so you have so few resources in house. The task of finding people is more difficult than it used to be. So they just contract out things. Uh, some folks work with temp services to do a lot of the work. Hey, you know, you're short on employees, you bring in temps. So yeah, that, that whole thing has changed. I think there will always be a need for some regular full-time folks. Um, but I have seen some organizations and I had the opportunity to work with a startup city. I don't know if this happens in many other states, but Georgia changed its uh, rules about 20 years ago to allow for unincorporated communities to become cities. Now, there's a well-defined oh, wow. process that they have to go through to become a city. But Georgia has, you know, probably 12, 15, 18 startups uh, that have come about, mostly in the metro Atlanta area. Um, and there's some now outside the area that are trying to start cities as well. Um, so when these new startups started coming about, you know, obviously it's too hard to try to start a city from scratch with staff and or city hall. And yeah, all that. I'd, I'd so they would, rent, that they would rent some office space and contract with a big firm because uh, there's several firms that will do this. They provide municipal operations. 
and right. everything would be contracted out. Now, each city did this in a little bit of a different way. Some of the cities will hire their own department director. So it's just at the senior level that the employees are regular full-time employees. And everybody else works for the contractor or contractors because they've had yeah. models where you know multiple contractors are working in a city at a given time. So uh, you might have um, you know, things like fire and police kind of hard to contract that out. Uh, so fire and police were the only regular employees they had aside from the department yeah. directors and well, you like know, city waste water, streets. But so every, every, everything yeah. else was contracted out to one of those wow. firms and then those municipal operations, even including things like planning and development services, building permits, all that kind of stuff. So, so yeah, that what you allude to related to the contracting is very real and it has become uh, big business for some of these yeah. firms, you know, to be oh, able yeah. to do that. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, so that increasing privatization of, of cities, yes, I think that's a, yeah. a very um, valid thought. Um, so, yeah, ev everything is being um, reshaped and rethought based upon the economy. And the other thing you got to figure, some of it's the economy, some of it's the pandemic, and some of it is just, just the way people look at work because, as we were saying, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, it was considered to be a great job to come work yeah. for a city or county government because of the benefit packages that we talked about yeah. earlier. Um, the benefit package, you know, the guaranteed paycheck, you know, every two weeks mm -hmm. or whatever it is, you know, you're going to get a check and you know it's the same amount of money, even though yeah. that check may be a little bit lower, you know, than where you would get someplace else. Yeah. There was definitely benefit to having those paid holidays and sick leave and all of that. Yeah, yeah. And so now it's not viewed as the greatest job in the world to go work for the city or county because as the economy has changed, there's so many jobs in private industry that pay so much more yeah. that sometimes yeah. folks are willing to sacrifice some of that stability and the uh, benefits in order to work someplace that that probably is going to pay a lot more. So the private sector, growth in the private sector and changes in the private economy really have impacted local government's ability to uh, recruit and retain good talent. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one. And when I, you know, young Pretty much everybody had an uncle or somebody that worked for the city. Everybody. And you knew you knew they didn't make a lot, but they made and of course, you know, back in I would say the the baby boomer generation, like a man could work and the money he made could support his whole family. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> five, six kids and everybody was happy. And but you kind of knew that, like, oh, he worked for the city, worked for the county, whatever, he made good money, but like his retirement package was like the best ever compared to like the guys exactly. at the auto factory and you know it's and stuff like that so that i knew that was kind of the the give and the take but now i think most people they just want to make as much money as they can right away and right figure away. that out later you know right. and, figure that out later. And, yeah. and of course the private firms do offer 401ks and things like that uh and that money is portable which is also yeah. something that makes it really attractive to work in the private sector these days. So, yeah. so yeah, um, we, we local government organizations that I still consider it a we, because even though I'm not working for a local government anymore, that's who my client base is. So I consider us a we, um, we, um, are in a whole different ball game in terms of, of being able to, to develop a stable workforce. And because of that, yes, contracted out and things like that have become very attractive and, and necessary in some cases. I, you, you used the word earlier and the words distrust. And mm -hmm. I would say one of the main catalysts for me starting this podcast was just to kind of bring light to all that you guys do. When I say you guys, you know, city mm -hmm. workers and people who mm -hmm. service or support municipalities and the reason being is because like when covid kicked off nobody really talked about the city employees who were still working through the pandemic who still had to make sure everybody's toilet flushed and the and, the, right. and, the, and that water got downstream and or, or the fresh water got to their home or the suites were still strapped and kept up and like nobody really talked about that so i said you know what i want to start a podcast where i can highlight the guys and gals who i think are frontline essential workers but I will say that since the industry is so coy, it's so it's so in the shadows, there's a certain distrust. It's kind of like, you know, we see with all 
the vaccine stuff. I mean, if you don't know what your government's doing, you're automatically not going to trust them. So mm -hmm. it's like <laughs> people have this sense of like, I don't know what the city does with all this money I'm giving to them. I don't know what, like, you know, there's still potholes in front of my house, like all that. And yeah. there's a certain distrust. How do you think cities can navigate that to where, you know, you don't have to tell everybody everything, but like, how can you put the, the constituents at ease and say, okay, we're doing right by your tax dollars? You know, when people ask me that question, I say, if you want to be trusted, be trustworthy. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's the first thing. Um, and, you know, and I, the things that I see drive citizens crazy are things like organizations that go into closed session a lot. It's like, why are they always in closed session? Even with the elected officials, you know, why are they always in closed session? Yeah, what's up with that? Um, if they look in the budget documents, you look online and you can't find every line item in a budget, you know, folks get suspicious of that. Uh, one of the organizations I work for, and I wish I knew the exact origin of this, but and this was pre-pandemic. This was my last, uh, when I was uh, administrator of the uh, Consolidated Augusta Richmond County government in Augusta, Georgia. Um, when I got there, they were always doing that. They were already doing this. So it wasn't a you know big deal with me, but um, they actually posted all of the checks they cut. There was, a, there was a ledger up on the website so you could see every check and how much it was and who it went to. Wow, so like all the um, vendors, employees? Yeah, all the vendors. So you wow. could go in there and see what X law firm was paid. Yeah. Yeah. what X landscaping company was paid. I mean, it was yeah. all up there. That's, you know, transparency builds trust for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. can see if the mayor's not giving it to his brother-in-law, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, yeah. and now, of course, it often led to more questions. You know, it's like, okay, well, they cut a trick to such and such firm. What's that for? Well, what did yeah. they do? Well, how many <laughs> miles of road did they pave? How many, you know, you know yeah, those numbers add yeah. up. So, you know, more information often leads to more questions. Um, yeah. But at least, as you said, the transparency gives folks the impression that, the, um, you know, that maybe there's not so much to hide if they're going to tell you every check that they could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I could see how that could benefit. Like, you know, at first, like, hey, we're going to show all the checks. And two months later, you're like, why are we doing this? This is crazy. Right, 10 right. times more work, 10 mm -hmm. times more inquiries. Mm -hmm. All right. So how does Janice keep getting better and better? You've been at, on the private side for some years. You've been on the public mm -hmm. side for some years. How do you keep sharpening your sword? How do you keep getting better year after year in what you do? You know what? I still go to the conferences and things. In fact, I probably go more now than I used to, like, and, you know, International wow. City County Managers Association, Georgia City County Managers Association. And I really regret that I did not do that every year when I was Why is working. That? Um, I would get so busy. It's like, oh, I got this coming up. I'm working on the budget right now. I can't get away, you know, be those sorts of things. And I didn't go, but the opportunity now to network with other professionals, you know, you see people that you do know that you've known for a long time you see people that you haven't met before but you get a chance to meet and network with them so and sometimes you know obviously we share our war stories you know I love walking around the exhibit hall and seeing what new products and services are available out there um, and um, I just I really appreciate the opportunity like you know most recently I went to the Georgia City County Managers Association meeting and uh, one of the things I did two things and this kind of in a nutshell sort of summarizes, I think, where I am. Um, the uh, uh, Carl Vinson Institute of Government at the University of Georgia does training for new managers. They have what they call new managers boot camp for new managers and aspiring managers who their bosses think are ready you know, to move up to the next level. So I was asked to help facilitate that training. They, they said, we have some experienced managers coming in to help facilitate the training. And, you know, I was like, translation, oh, but okay. <laughs> and um, I, I did that. So that was my opportunity to give back. I can tell some of my war stories as a way to give back to those new and up and coming managers. And the way that I got from the conference was one of our things, we always have mobile workshops and things like that. So we took a walking tour of one of the new cities that I talked about earlier. Uh, we were in Dunwoody, Georgia, they were our host. Um, took a tour uh, just 
walk through various aspects of their uh, downtown. And, you know, each one of these cities has its own story. So I just learned a lot in terms of, hey, this was a formerly suburban Atlanta suburban community um, that is coming into its own. You know, it is a retail hub. It's an office hub. You know, like State Farm Insurance has a huge presence there. Um, and now they're doing a lot of mixed income development, not mixed income, but mixed use development where there's retail and residential and office sort of all in the same place. Um, and it's just a whole different way to look at and build community. So I love just learning from those experiences. And even though, you know, the economic development space isn't my primary area, it still keeps me in the game in terms of what's happening in local government. So I have a better understanding when I am interviewing somebody for a city manager job or even an economic development director job or what have you, because I've seen all of that stuff, I have a better understanding of what they're talking about as they respond to questions about their experience in that particular area. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. What would you say is the biggest misconception? Let's talk to the city manager side. What would you mm -hmm. say is the biggest misconception about a city manager? Let's say I asked one of your best friends, like what is you know, when what you were a city manager? manager? Yeah. yeah, what is, what does Janice do? What does she do for the community? What would she get you know, wrong and answer that? People <laughs> largely just don't have a clue. First off, I think you had one guest a while back that said he had never heard anybody put city and manager together in the same sentence. He didn't even know that was a job or a term, you know. So there's misconception about that, particularly in organizations where there is a mayor, uh, which most of them do on the city side. You know, you're going to have one. People just automatically assume the mayor runs the day to day operations and everybody who is there works for the mayor. It's like, no, that's not the way this works, particularly with a council manager form of government. Um, so because they misunderstand what the mayor does, they then misunderstand what the city manager does, you know. Um, but but yeah, they they just they either think that you have more power than you do, as in they think you can snap your fingers and make everything happen and everybody's going to bow down to you. <laughs> or they don't understand the degree to which you have power. Like for instance, reviewing disciplinary decisions, you know, say there's an employee that's up for termination and the city manager in that structure is reviewing that termination to decide if in fact the person should stay or go. And um, cause I've had people go, you do that too? It's like, yeah, I do that all the time. I mean, that's, that's part of the job is making sure that employees um, disciplinary actions are handled fairly. And, and I see it that way because I don't, you know, just because a department director says this person needs to go um, in the litigious environment in which we live, we need to make sure that that person really has done something that's um, worthy of a termination. Um, so, you know, having to just balance the facts, gather information, balance facts, and make those types of decisions is one of the things I think people don't have a clue of how much city managers get into the whole personnel realm. Uh, and that's going to uh, vary to based upon the charter of your organization. But in most of the ones I've worked, the managers had a key role there. Um, one of the other ones is, uh, again, getting to the big ones, the people and money, um, the um, budget. And I tell them, yeah, yeah, I do the recommended budget. At that time, the city of Augusta's budget was $850 million or something like that. And um, it's like, yeah, I, I got to get this. I'm working hard because I got to get this budget out. And people are like, really? You got to do all that stuff? I was like, yeah, I do all that stuff. And then there was another one, a third one, and then I'll shut up on that topic. But um, one night I was at a July 4th. We had this big July 4th fireworks show in Augusta. And I had taken some friends with me because, you know, we had uh, we have priority seating for the uh, administrator and um, elected officials and things like that. And it's set up so that we could bring guests. So I had some guests with me and it happened had to happen to be that night that there was a shooting on the. Yeah. Yeah. During the fireworks show. Yeah. Not good. Yeah. We, we had a shooting downtown and um, I guess the parks director called me to let me know that this has happened because, you know, the parks director is pretty much in charge of this event. So he yeah. reaches out to me to tell me it happened. And I said, hmm, I guess I better let our elected officials know right now that this happened so that they aren't caught by surprise when this comes up on the news. 
So I'm sitting there on my little iPhone tapping out a message to all of our elected officials to make sure that they aren't caught by surprise. And one of my friends who was with me said, I didn't have any idea you had to do that. And I'm like, yeah, it's a good idea for me to do that because yeah. Yeah, I don't want my elected officials blindsided. If I knew and they didn't, that's not a good thing. Mm. Yeah, interesting. So that that kind of that that job entails that also. You're mm -hmm. you're that kind of the liaison. Yeah. yeah, that constant communication with your elected officials, yeah. and yes, being that liaison, you know, they don't have to know. We're talking about transparency. You know, every little detail. No, they don't have to know that. But yeah. if there's a shooting on the river downtown during our biggest event, yeah, they kind of need to know that one. Yeah, yeah. Do you let them know about like SSO sanitary sewer overflows? Do you let them know about you know, you know, a slip and fall with a, a construction worker or something like that? Or probably it... not. So, okay. so my 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 line would be, or my deciding factor would be, is this uh, is some TV station or newspaper going to pick up on this? Uh, so if okay. there's a slip and fall, nah, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to pick up on that one. But if there's a shooting when yeah. they're you know 20,000 people downtown yeah they'll pick up on that one Ooh, the yeah. media will pick up on that one i i want to get a little tactical with you i let's say there's youngsters listening to this and they want to be a city manager one day what would they do pre during and post interview to be able to land a position like that like what kind of prep work would they want to put into it and then during the interview any like any buzzwords, any uh, sayings, any kind of line of, of thought or any questions you can answer during the interview. And then also after the interview, what's the follow up process like to be able to land an interview yeah. like that? You know what? Um, being a city manager, they used to be sort of well defined paths. They're not as much anymore um, because this is what I'll, I'll tell you what I was told, you know, 30 years ago. And I'll tell you what what happens now. Uh, the it used to be that you would want people a somebody with a master's degree probably in public administration or public policy something like that um and you would want them to have worked in an environment where they had exposure to the entire organization for instance and i'll go back to what i said the people in the money somebody who's worked in hr say been uh, a manager deputy director or even an hr director somebody who has been um, a budget uh, analyst, say in a bigger city, who then maybe wants to apply for an assistant city manager job in a smaller city, um, that would be a good path. Because again, you want to see the breadth and the depth of the organization. And you can do that from HR or finance, you know, finance budget roles. Um, yeah, yeah, I've that, seen that, police mm -hmm. chiefs be city and managers. Now, that exactly. Okay. That's the <laughs> Um, now police chiefs uh, are getting into it. Um, fire chiefs, I've seen fire chiefs move up into those roles. Um, and even also uh, uh, facilities folks. And I said the facilities ones now, they, I think they too have broader exposure than some of the other jobs because if you're doing facilities yeah. for the whole organization, you're going to see everybody's stuff. And you have yeah. some familiarity with the organization. I know one of the big things for me, and I may be one who thinks about this more than some others do, but um, <laughs> I have seen situations where if somebody who is from a department, let's say Parks and Rec, and I don't want to pick on anybody because I got some you know, good friends that went from Parks and Rec to being assistant city managers okay. or city managers, but um, the thinking often is, Parks and Rec is what he or she understands. So when the new parks director comes in with his or her budget request, that now city manager who used to be a parks director is going to be more likely to fulfill their budget request because they uh, understand it. <laughs> they're playing they favorites. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I know it's you. Their yeah. thing. They, they got it. Whereas. Probably if, public if, works directors also. If, an, if a public works director or an IT director comes in with a budget yeah. request, they may not understand those so well. <laughs> so they're yeah. going to be less sympathetic to their needs. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why that person who's worked in budget, who's been a you know assistant finance director or finance director, 
who's been an HR director or assistant director, or even like I said, a facility central services type who has, again, had a broad view of the entire organization probably would be better suited, is thought to be better suited for the role just because they've seen everything. Gotcha. You know? gotcha. um, one of the other things I also see now more is particularly with the hiring process, I mentioned I do executive search with developmental associates. The way we do it is that we start off by asking the elected officials or the hiring manager, whoever that is, we start off by asking them, hey, what are your major challenges right now? Yeah. So we then look for people who have experience with some of those major challenges. And, yeah. you know, if their challenges are on the economic development side, if their challenges are on the public safety side, you know, it's going to benefit, uh, it's going to be more tailored toward the applicants who have experience with those specific things. Yeah. Okay. Let's say you're commissioned to put up a billboard and this billboard is in the most trafficked area of Augusta. What mm -hmm. ask of your community in regards to public works would you put on this billboard? In regards to public works. Wow. <laughs> no littering allowed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then and then I, I have to ask the question, since you're on the city manager side, what ask of the community in regards to just your city manager position, mm -hmm. what would that be? In, just in regard to the position? Yeah. Um, from my perspective, sometimes I would want to put it, we really do care. Yeah. Because really? they have the impression, yeah. you know, nobody down there cares about us. They're just looking out for uh, themselves and their quote unquote high salaries and they don't give up about what happens yeah. in the community, you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah. we really do care. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. I always like to leave a space on the show for you to thank mentors that you had along your journey. Mm -hmm. And then also, since you've been a city manager, give a word of inspiration and motivation to your fellow, I guess, countrywide industry counterparts okay um god the motivation for them is hang in there <laughs> because <laughs> is it, that tough? You know, it has become increasingly tough um as you see particularly um folks who don't want to color within the lines and when i say don't want to color within the lines i'm talking about every organization has a charter code of ordinances etc cetera, etc cetera. and there has definitely been a trend toward uh elected officials in particular who don't necessarily believe in the lines, you know? Um, just don't believe in them. Yeah, they just don't believe in that. And that makes it extremely hard for a manager to maintain the type of control over the organization um, that they need to have, you know, for instance, and this is a classic, you know, getting into uh, personnel matters and things like that. Um, uh, Augusta, in fact, right now is having some discussions about, you know, what the responsibilities of the position should, administrative position should be, because it's not a true manager council form. And um, you have those, they need to have those discussions because if uh, an employee thinks that he or she can find favor with elected officials in a way that prevents them from having to carry out their day to day job responsibilities, that's a problem. So, but this this whole idea of you know who's in charge uh, has really gotten to be a, a, a particular problem in many local governments. I hear it over and over and over again as I talk to people. So that's why I say hang in there, um, uh, okay. because the the nature of the job, the expectations, and all that have really changed. And like I said, folks aren't necessarily coloring within the lines. Yeah. Um, and there was a question you asked me before that. Yep. Uh, the mentors you had along your journey. You okay, mentors. Thanks, any shout outs? Gosh, um, the my my favorite best mentor, unfortunately, is deceased. In fact, a couple of my mentors are deceased, but I'll talk about them anyway because I can talk about what they brought um, to me. Um, what I said earlier about having people who've been in uh, roles in the organization where they can kind of see everything are going to be your best candidates to move up to a, a manager position. Uh, I got that from Joe Bradshaw, who was an assistant county manager in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, which is where Charles located. When I was in graduate school, I worked for him. I did my summer internship working with him. 
And um, I learned so much from Joe Bradshaw. Unfortunately, he had some illnesses and passed away. Gosh, it's been a number of years ago now. Gosh, Joe must have passed away in the late 90s. Um, but yeah, he was just a really sharp guy, you know, respected the business, understood the business. Um, and I enjoyed uh, all of the things he, he used that internship as a way to teach. You know, yeah, I had some work experience, but it was a teaching experience. He was just sharing everything that he knew with me. So um, and he loved having interns. He did an intern every summer, you know, because they, they allowed the budget for that and he made it work. So uh, Joe was one. Next one was um, Roy Lane. He was the city manager in Albany, Georgia, that hired me for my first assistant city manager position. And um, we made a great team. You would look at us and you would think, gosh, you know, some, he was from Millersville, Georgia, which is a relatively small city in Georgia. And, you know, and his name's Roy. So you're thinking, heck, <laughs> you know, but um, and he came from more of a non-traditional background. He actually came from the housing authority. He had been executive director of the housing authority for a few years, but he was in town and they knew he was committed to the city and they, they brought him in and he didn't have all of the, you know, background on public works and police and fire and all that stuff. He didn't come into it with that, but he learned how he knew how to listen to his department directors. And that was something that I learned from him is that you never know it all. You may be sitting in that chair and you may, may be the highest paid person in the organization, but you don't know everything. Um, so there is a need to listen to and rely upon the expertise of your department directors. And we did that every day. I worked for him for three years. It was a great three years of my life. Um, and one, because, yeah, he taught me that, you know, that was very important always. So if you're listening to them, they feel respected. And if they feel respected, they'll fall on a sword for you because they feel like they're really a part of the team. So and the other thing, you know, we would be working on, you know, grant projects because he was really aggressive about pursuing some federal grants. Um, and uh, we would be there in the middle of the night working on grant projects and he'd be right there with us. You know, he, he didn't expect dump a bunch of work on you and walk out the door. He worked right along with you. So, yeah, that was a great learning experience working for him. OK, thank you for that. Last question. If I'm coming to town, I text you ahead of time and I say, hey, Janice, I'm coming to Augusta. Where can I get the best burger in Augusta? Where are you going to send me? You know, you're asking a vegetarian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but well, where, where would you take me? Where would you send me yeah, to lunch? <laughs> I'm, I, I got to give you two options. You can go to the whiskey bar, uh, which is okay. on Broad Street. And the whiskey bar has all sorts of variations on burgers and they've got a veggie patty too. So, but there are all these different variations. Um, so that's a good place. And of course, I, and their sides are also fabulous. You know, you, you can yeah. order some, you know, onion rings. They're not greasy. You can order the steamed veggies. They got them nice and well seasoned. And, yeah. and they've got, you know, probably, I don't know, two dozen different types of burgers. Yeah. So, you could also go to the sportsman billiards or something like that. I've never been in there. It's on the lower end of Broad Street, which is considered a little seedy because the strip clubs are down there too. But but everybody <laughs> nice. says their burgers are really good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Well, Janice, thank you for hopping on the podcast. Where can people find more about Jackson Allen Associates? Um, and then also uh, the Local Matters podcast. Yeah, we'll go with the Local Matters podcast first and just let you know, I started the podcast because of some of the things you asked earlier. You know, what do people not know about city managers? There's just so much people don't know about government, period, local government, period. Um, and state government, too. So I cover some state government topics uh, just because folks, you know, don't have a clue of who does all this stuff. And, you know, you know, you're paying taxes to somebody. So figure out what you're paying it to get, you know. So uh, I started the podcast three and a half years ago. First, you know, I didn't know what I was doing with it. It started off as a little radio show. And then I was talking to somebody said, you know, podcasting is the thing these days because it's on demand, which sort of goes with that Uberization of, of things that you were talking about earlier. So uh, we have a podcast version. 
SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts, uh, Local Matters Podcast of Georgia. Just look it up and please uh, listen to some episodes there. I also started a YouTube channel about a year, year and a half ago, and it is also Local Matters Podcast of Georgia. I'm on, not on YouTube that often. You know, every single thing is not on YouTube. I, I say what I put on YouTube is those things of nat natural national interest, you know, so we have talked about uh, local government things that affect you nationally. Uh, we've had an interview with a city manager who's been quite controversial. So that's on there. Uh, I've got things about the Memphis police murder of Tyree Nichols. Uh, I've got the Flint water crisis and actually speaking to somebody who was an educator at the time. And she explained some impact of that water crisis that I had never, you know, even thought of. You know, she talked about how the children were so poorly behaved and it was attributed to the, the poor water, poor quality of water, which gets specifically to public works. Um, wow. You know, you know, it's not just that it would make you sick. It made kids poorly behaved. And um, she I talked know. about the things that the state put in place to help them overcome the challenges that all those school children were having. So that's a really interesting show. I thought I got one on homelessness and, you know, it's about what's happening in Augusta related to homelessness, but we get into national trends as well. So, so yeah, I've got some really good stuff there that I think is very interesting. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel of the Local Matters Podcast of Georgia. And uh, for my consulting practice, Janice Allen Jackson and Associates, you can Google that or go to my website, which is JaniceAllenJackson.Weebly.com. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, Janice, once again, thank you for hopping on the show. To all the listeners out there, make sure you share this with somebody who you think needs to hear it. Uh, Janice, any final words before we get out of here? Um, local government was a calling for me. And mm. we have to look for as people get into the profession, it, it really needs to be a calling for you too, um, mm -hmm. because those are the ones who stay with it. You know, if it's yeah. not a calling, you'll say, forget this. <laughs> you'll yeah. just say, forget it. And um, you want to, building relationships with your residents is one of the most important things that anybody in local mm -hmm. government can do, because you do need to have that trust. And um, you, you, they do have to understand that you really care about the quality of services that's being provided in exchange for the tax dollar that you're forcibly collecting from them. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Well, Janice, again, thank you for hopping on. This has been the Public Works Podcast, and thank you for tuning in.